Welcome back to another instalment of New Zealand's Bird of the Week, where in this video I will be talking about the bellbirds, the most widespread and familiar honey eaters in the country, with their song being a staple of the New Zealand's bird song chorus. I hope you enjoy. Bellbirds are a staple New Zealand endemic bird species, among the most iconic and well known, something which is helped by them being fairly common across much of the South and North Islands. Also known of by their Maori names of Korimako, Makomako, and Komako. They are medium sized, with birds being around 20cm in length, just more than blackbirds, as a reference, and can weigh anywhere from 26 grams for females and up to 34 for males. They are a yellowish green in colour overall, being a general olive green all over, with them being slightly paler on their underparts. Males and females have slight differences in appearance, alongside their size, with the latter being duller, being more of an olive green than greenish yellow, and also have a fainter purplish sheen on their heads than the males alongside possessing a narrow, white-yellow stripe across their cheek. Adults have notably red eyes, with them also having a distinctive, loud whirring noise as they fly, since the modified primary feathers form slots in their wings that create said whirring noises. Male birds will utilise this feature to great effect during territorial disputes, accentuating the sounds to make them appear far more threatening and dominant. There are three known subspecies, separable based on their minor differences in plumage and size, with them being the three king's bellbirds, which are now uncommon and at risk, the poor knight's bellbirds, which are also at risk, and the most common subspecies being the common bellbirds, being well known of throughout mainland New Zealand, also being non-threatened. They are also the only living member of the genus Anthornis, and alongside up to 190 other species in 55 genera, comprise the family Melifagidae, the honey eaters. A related but separate species, that being the Chasm Islands bellbirds, persisted until the early 1900s and were quite a bit larger than living birds, also having a darker head. Their song, consisting of high pitched, ringing notes that are very clear, are a welcome part of New Zealand's endemic and native dawn chorus and throughout the day, with them adding much to native forests where there may be otherwise very little native bird song. Their song varies depending on the region of the country they're from, as will be further delved into although it typically consists of two to six pure bell-type notes, which are often repeated for periods of anywhere from 10 to even 40 minutes. They can be heard at any time of day, but more often during dawn and in their breeding season, also performing sounds like chonks, clonks and harsh jars to add a variation. These distinct sounds, which have been described by some as resembling the chiming of incredibly fine bells, can be listened to here as an example of their repertoire. This song caught the attention of early European settlers upon their arrival, with Captain Cook referring to them as having a various and melodious song, with them sounding like, quote, small bells exquisitely tuned, end quote. Birds will also utilise a harsh, disjointed and exasperated yang-like call that they use when alarmed, either to alert other birds that there is danger, like a potential predator, or when fighting over food resources, as can so often be the case amongst either members of their own kind or against a larger tui which often use their larger size to bully them off of food sources. Both male and female birds will perform duets together, with birds also singing against each other to define their own territorial boundaries. While both sexes are active singers in this regard, males have been noticed to have a wider repertoire of songs, and are also more vocally active outside of their breeding season, likely down to having to maintain their territories from other males, with this indeed being known to play a role in competitive interactions and resource defence. Juvenile bellbirds will also learn to sing by mimicking their parents and or neighbouring bellbirds of the same sex, and because of this, tunes and song compositions can vary from place to place, forming local dialects or accents. While their bell notes are always present, their combination and variety of their calls differs from place to place with their syllables being put together in different ways, 
with more work into the differences between populations having genetic underpinnings or a purely cultural element being necessary to answer some of the questions as to how rapidly song changes occur and how their syntax can change over time and under what context. Their song is often confused with that of the related Tui, although they do have some general differences in that billbirds have a smaller range of calls, with the also being generally more clear and slower paced, with Tui including less musical notes, more so using extensive grunts, wheezes and clicks. Birds can however still be confused with each other quite frequently, as Tui can be excellent mimickers, particularly of bellbirds, and some bellbirds will incorporate wheezing attributes found in Tui, so it's not always so clear cut. They also have a curved beak and a brush-like tongue, which they use to reach deeply into flowers to reach nectar, with their brush-tipped tongues allowing them to better obtain said food sources. In doing so, they provide an important ecological role in pollinating the flowers of many native shrubs and trees, as well as in the dispersal of seeds, since they will also feed on the fruits and berries from a range of plants, including podocarps like Totara. This can be seen well by both the vibrant blue and yellow pollen of fuchsia and flax respectively on their faces, with them assisting the plants in cross-pollination as well. When their nectar sources start to disappear broadly in summer and autumn, they will, as mentioned, feed on berries and fruits, although they will also become more insectivorous, supplementing their diets when the chance presents itself. Females tend to feed on insects more than male birds do, possibly either because the larger and more aggressive males chase them away from more plentiful nectar sites, or because they spend more time gathering insects for feeding their chicks as they grow. Billbirds have also been found to have remarkably accurate spatial memory, with individuals being able to relocate to rewards across a range of concentration treatments, with them being able to retain said information for periods of up to 20 days, as well as being able to associate visual cues with reward characteristics. This therefore translates to an increased foraging efficiency, as birds are better able to both map out the number of flowering plants available, but also as to their location from landmarks and the general environment, even if they've been absent for extensive periods. When it comes to the habitation, they are common across much of their range, and reach extraordinarily high densities on predator-free offshore islands, at levels which they almost certainly did so in pre-human New Zealand, with densities of up to 5.5 to 9.1 pairs per hectare in some cases. They are most common in dense native forests, although are also found in some exotic forests where enough food is available, alongside scrub, farm shelter belts, as well as parks and gardens. They breed in spring and summer, with pairs being territorial while doing so, chasing off rivals, although they will leave their territories often to feed. Their nests are often made in forked branches under dense cover, also being made exclusively by the females, from near ground level to over 5 metres. Their nesting habits are similar to Tui, with them also having clutches of three to four eggs, which are pinkish brown with spots and blotches, as well as having a similar incubation period of about 14 days. The female will incubate, and afterwards, both the female and the male will feed the chicks, mainly providing them with small insects and spiders. The young will then fledge after two weeks, and will then continue to be fed for another week or two as they get their bearings. Billbirds were abundant in the early days of settlements when Europeans arrived although they became unaccountably scarce during the latter period of the 19th century, and were for quite a time believed to be on the way out towards extinction. This massive decline, perhaps due to the massive habitat destruction, alongside a large influx of new predators and likely disease, really brought their numbers down, although a recovery was however made, and they are now common again over a large part of the country, except up in Northland and parts of Auckland. Bees and wasps have also been known to affect their ability to forage on flowering plants, with possums also being another factor that's both impacts their food sources and prey on chicks. Birds that coexist with high levels of exotic predation have been noted to decrease their nestling feeding rates when compared to birds on offshore islands with no such factor, although they did not increase their feeding when predators were experimentally removed. They do, however, still feed their nestlings twice as often as related honey eaters in Tasmania. As such, they do appear to have adapted to exotic predation, although they still retain behavioural traits present in naive populations. And with that, I thank you for watching this instalment of New Zealand's Bird of the Week. For next time, you're now able to vote for the Campbell Black Browse Mollymork, birds that appear to be consistently frowning due to their black eye markings, and alongside their orange bills and all white bodies, stand out quite well. With that, I'll see you next time, whenever that's may be.